The best health care is there in ways big and small. There when we most and least expect it. We may not see it, but we feel it. It lets us know we're not in this alone. Everyone deserves a health care partner who never quits. One who's there for what matters. United Healthcare, there for what matters. Want your boss to put some real action behind the rhetoric when they talk about making your workplace more inclusive? Find out how to hold their feet to the fire and demand diversity on the Diversity Dude podcast. Hello there, and welcome back to the Diversity Dude podcast. I'm your host, Lambert Fisher marriage and family therapist, award-winning author, and national speaker on the topic of multicultural awareness and diversity. And for those of you who are interested in even more positive and encouraging tips and strategies beyond what I share in podcasts like this, then feel free to check out my award-winning book, Diversity in Clinical Practice, nationally recognized for the unique way in which it addresses the often difficult topic of multicultural awareness and diversity. Designed for more than just therapists, if you are a helping professional in any way, diversity in clinical practice can help you meet the greatest variety of cultural needs possible for those whom you serve, and it's available in paper and audiobook versions for your convenience. And whether it be through my one-on-one relationship building efforts as a therapist, or my informing and empowering efforts as an author or speaker, know that my personal mission is to do my part to improve the world one strengthened relationship at a time. So. Today, I want to share with you a few encouraging words about avoiding racial gaslighting. Now, if you haven't heard of the term, or if you have but didn't know what it meant, gaslighting in general is a form of psychological manipulation or abuse where someone attempts to sow self-doubt and confusion, causing someone to question their own thoughts, feelings, memories, or even their perception of reality. In relationships, an abusive person might gaslight their partner as a way to control their partner and avoid personal responsibility for any harm they've caused by convincing their partner that not only are they not really in the pain that they think they're experiencing, but what they believe to be the cause of their pain isn't real either. Why do I bring that up? Well, As we continue the month of February, during which we celebrate Black Heritage Month, I'm continually reminded of how many times people in the African-American community make efforts to discuss not only the difficulties of the past that were overcome, but also the concerns and cautions they have in the present that they feel are impacted by racial differences, only to be met with disinterest at best or direct opposition at worst, with some even expressing statements like, okay, we get it. Slavery was bad, but slavery ended a long time ago, and racism is over now, so why are we still talking about this? Why why can't you just get over it? To many, this feels very similar for trying to convince me that my emotional or psychological pain or what I believe to be the cause of my pain not only isn't the cause, but can't be the cause because it doesn't even exist. Feels familiar, as if gaslighting, but racially. Now, for many, there are a lot of instantaneous responses that feel compelled to come up after statements like this, some healthy, some not so healthy, all emotionally legitimate either way. But in order to assist those who have made this or similar statements in the past or identify with it presently and can see yourself expressing such in the near future, I'd like to share a few considerations that can help you avoid unintentionally racially gaslighting someone you care about or work with, causing unnecessary damage to the personal or professional relationships you might have with those persons who hear. And as usual, instead of restating many of the historical or political or even academic answers to this question that you may hear infrequently, I like to speak primarily from a therapeutic relationship focused perspective and offer as much value as I can. Consideration number one, just because something happened in the past doesn't mean that it has no impact on the present. Whenever I hear someone make the argument that slavery ended a long time ago, my immediate response is, did it though? Now, I get it. What I mean by this initially is that, was it that long ago? For many, the history of slavery in this country feels as distant and irrelevant to their daily lives as learning about the dinosaurs. And yet there are many who have to go only a few generations back on their family tree to see family members who are either slaves or slave owners. When someone has grown up with grandparents who can say that their grandparents were slaves, not only does it make that history a little closer to the present, but the life lessons that were passed down, both helpful and unhelpful, seem a lot more understandable. 
Sure, the challenge is to do the work to determine how much of the protective coping skills that were needed to keep people alive are still needed today. But if we look harder, we can see that even that isn't always easy to determine. Why? Well, just because the form of the threat that generated the protective need has changed doesn't mean that the protective need isn't still relevant. Well, let me put it this way. Years of slavery happened. There's no question about that. Nor is there a question that it had a devastating physical, psychological, and emotional impact on those directly involved. But when slavery ended, legally enforced segregation still directly negatively impacted the lives of African Americans in this country for years, limiting the opportunities they had to build and live their best lives or even feel safe to want to live better lives. But when legally supported segregation ended, there was still socially accepted overt discrimination to contend with. Though it shouldn't have been supported, it was legally allowable and thus did still happen. And then over time and with much, much effort, even when increasing amounts of restrictions made overt racial discrimination illegal, many found ways to maintain covert, subtle discrimination nonetheless. Utilizing systems of power and influence, whether it be political, educational, corporate, or even within the law enforcement system, plausible deniability has been the goal for years for many in ways to maintain a comfortable norm or just the way things are that benefit some and exclude others without repercussions. And the beauty of it is that if subtle and covert is the goal, then not only can someone defensively claim plausible deniability, avoiding consequences, but they can also go on the offensive and try to make the person impacted by racism and discrimination believe that the racism and discrimination never really happened in the first place, just because it didn't look like it did before. Thus, it must all be in your head, making it about race when there's no obvious broken rule which just like the intimate relationships we talked about earlier is where the term racial gaslighting becomes very applicable, which leads to consideration number two, just because it isn't hurting you doesn't mean it's not impacting me. Some people are not intentionally gaslighting others into believing racism or discrimination doesn't exist. Instead, they genuinely believe it based on their lack of intention to harm others, as well as their personal belief that racism and discrimination has to look a certain way. It has to be overt, loud, negative in order to really be hurtful. They might even unintentionally have the same gaslighting impact on someone else, challenging their perception of reality. Unfortunately, as I've learned therapeutically, you don't need to share or feel or agree with or even confirm the existence of my feelings in order for them to be legitimate as my reality for me. Or put more simply, just because it isn't hurting you doesn't mean it's not impacting me. If someone you know is expressing their concerns and they feel they were racially discriminated against, even if you don't see it that way or doesn't feel like discrimination to you, at the very least, don't let that be the first thing out of your mouth. Instead, take a moment to ask yourself, could there be physical, psychological, or even emotional pain that they might be experiencing even if I don't share the same pain? What past experiences might they have had that might be influenced in their interpretation, even if I don't share those experiences? Or even better, what past hurts might they have experienced, such that the scenario might be reminding them of such and making them fear that future harm is on the way? You see, our feelings don't guarantee facts when it comes to declaring what someone else thinks or feels. For example, saying, I feel like you're being a racist, may not guarantee that the other person is intentionally trying to convey racist beliefs. However, it does guarantee that something that was said or done conveyed a message, intentionally or not, that felt racist. And this is enough at least to pause forward movement and address this perception head on for the sake of the relationship, which is addressed by consideration number three. Convincing someone that the problem doesn't exist doesn't address whatever problem does exist. The best way to solve the problem you don't see is not to convince the other person that they must be delusional because the problem doesn't exist. It's all in their mind and other relating insults. Instead, the best support you can provide is to create an emotionally safe place for someone to share their concerns that they may have based on the experiences that they've had or preparing to have. And most importantly, what past experiences, personal, witnessed, or informed by trusted sources are impacting their perspective, making them see reason to take steps to protect themselves and their loved ones from perceived threats. And at the end of the day, 
these considerations can help significantly reduce the amount of racial gaslighting you might unintentionally perpetuate on others. I look forward to the day when people think twice before making statements like, why is it always about race? Which unintentionally minimizes the value race has on someone's identity, their cautions, their concerns, and past negative experiences. Or racism doesn't exist anymore, minimizing someone's perceived experiences of racism, despite the evidence to back it up. All that does is convey a desire to ignore or perpetuate racism by convincing them to stop looking at it. Just because it doesn't look like it did before, it doesn't mean it's not causing real pain to someone else. Or, are you sure that's really hap what happened? Insulting someone's intelligence and also conveying the desire to continue the hurtful behavior by convincing a hurtful person that their hurt really isn't what they think it is. As usual, I don't expect any of us to always know what someone else is feeling or how they're perceiving the world. I definitely don't expect you to know all of the historical experiences that they might be that might be impacting their hopes as well as their concerns. However, my hope for you is that you would practice avoiding the temptation to help someone by dismissing their reality, essentially unintentionally racially gaslighting. Offering help to someone in pain by convincing them that they're not really in pain is not as helpful as it seems. Instead, help them by validating their experiences, their resulting feelings, and identifying what is within their power to change in their present and future reality to improve their lives. If more people did this, a lot more healthier conversations would occur. Relationships would be strengthened. We'd learn a lot more about the impact we have on others, and we would be equipped with the knowledge of how we can reduce perpetuating an unintentionally negative impact on others moving forward in our personal and professional lives as well. And with that, I'll say thanks again for listening to today's Diversity Do podcast. If you have any pressing diversity-related questions that you'd like me to address on an upcoming podcast, or if your organization is in need of a shame-free or empowering guest speaker or training on this often sensitive topic, then feel free to reach out to me directly at www.diversitymadesimple.com. And if you know of anyone else who can benefit from a positive and encouraging perspective on this often difficult topic of diversity, then feel free to send a link to this podcast so they can be encouraged as well. Or share with them my award-winning book, Diversity in Clinical Practice, available at Amazon.com. And as usual, I look forward to addressing as many topics as possible in future podcasts to help you improve as many relationships as possible at work, at home, and in your community. And as always, remember this. You don't need to know everything about everyone in order to have a positive impact on someone. Thank you all for tuning in, and have a great day. Tune in each week and find out how to demand and implement diversity at your job. To hear more, check out previous Diversity Dude shows on ShalettaMakesMeLaugh.com. Are you up to date on your COVID-19 vaccination? It's not a one-and-done situation. You and your family may have gotten the original COVID-19 vaccine, but the virus keeps evolving. Getting the updated COVID-19 vaccine will protect you from newer variants that are circulating in our community. Talk to your health care provider to be sure you've received the updated vaccine. The new vaccines are approved for all and everyone six months of age and older, even for people who are immunocompromised or are pregnant or breastfeeding. To find out where you and your family can get your updated vaccine, go to vaccines.gov. That's vaccines.gov. Just type in your zip code and you'll find a convenient nearby option. Protect yourself and others this winter. It's not just another day in your life. Things are changing for the better. At Comcast, we see those changes and we're thinking about how we use technology today to live, work, learn, and play. And we're building for the future now so we're better prepared for the wants and needs of tomorrow. That's why Comcast is rolling out multi-gig internet speeds to more than 50 million homes and businesses before the end of 2025, making our already industry-leading network even faster, smarter, greener, and more reliable. Over the decades, Comcast has been your partner, working hard to serve your community and we'll continue to be your partner. We're expanding our gigabits, 
so you can enjoy the tiny bits that matter most. You know Shaletta makes you laugh, but did you know Shaletta Brundage can also make you think and boost your business? Media personality, activist, and comedian Shaletta Brundage founded Shaletta Makes Me Laugh to celebrate and share the best of black culture. It's a podcasting platform. You can download 10 weekly podcasts hosted by African-American subject experts at ShalettaMakesMeLaugh.com or wherever you find your favorite podcasts. ShalettaMakesMeLaugh.com is also a production house creating broadcast quality commercial content. And Shaletta and her team of storytellers create powerful promotional campaigns to get businesses the brand awareness they're looking for. Some of Minnesota's top businesses trust Shaletta, and you can too. Get out the word about your events and products and get in front of communities of color with ShalettaMakesMeLaugh.com. She's got the power to help your business. Unleash the power of smile for your team. Delta Dental of Minnesota offers coverage to fit your unique small business, leading to a better benefit package and a happier team. Visit deltadentalmn.org forward slash small business. Are you a woman known as a good listener? Do you have skills in de-escalating situations? Are you what they call a people person? then the Minneapolis Police Department would like to meet you. Now in a rebuilding phase, the Minneapolis Police Department is recruiting more women to wear the badge. The department offers career options for women with a high school diploma or GED. There are also opportunities for women with two- and four-year degrees who are ready to apply their skills in new ways. Police work makes a great second career for social workers, teachers, nurses. Women in their 30s and 40s are welcome to apply. There's no age cap. You'll be paid while you train and mentored by veteran women officers invested in your success. Minneapolis also welcomes current police officers to join the state's largest department. Make a difference on the streets, working in your community, in a career with competitive salaries and generous benefits. Go to MinneapolisMN.gov and search police jobs to find out more. 